as is our normal custom, we'll begin with our favorite part of the meeting, which is a green themes presentation. This, this evening, we're very happy to have with us Mike Pennington, a wetland mitigation specialist with DEQ. And this is especially uh, uh, timely in as much as the Environmental Commission has been looking into the issue of wetland banking here in the township, both uh, for municipal projects and potentially farther afield. So we're very happy to have you with us and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. So I, I first want to say thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Mike Pennington. I'm the DEQ's Wetland Mitigation Specialist. Just to give you a little bit of my background, I've been with the DEQ for about six years now in that wetland mitigation, wetland ban banking role. And prior to that time, I was with the Michigan DOT doing basically the same thing for about 14 years. So I spent about tw 20 years of my career working specifically on wetland mitigation, wetland restoration, wetland banking. Um, I'm kind of here just to provide you guys with some, some information. I want it to be r really informal. Um, this is something that's really passionate to me because I've been involved in this for so long. I love wetland banking. I think it's a great path. So I'm going to give you guys some information, um, talk to you about a little grant and loan program that the DEQ has. And if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free, free to ask. So when I talk about wetland banking, first I have to talk about the obligatory slides and what is wetland mitigation. So the DEQ defines wetland mitigation as the replacement of un unavoidable losses of wetland resources. And basically what you're trying to do is restore those functions and values of the wetlands that are lost. At the DEQ, we consider mitigation as a sequence. You know, under the statute, you have to avoid to the greatest extent possible. If you can't completely avoid, you have to minimize. And then what I'm going to talk to you about with wetland banking is what's considered compensatory mitigation. So while we consider wetland banking as compensatory mitigation, when what we consider the mitigation sequence is the whole thing, avoidance, minimization, and then finally mitigation. So under current statutes, mitigation um, is required for all projects as far as the state. I know the local ordinance is different. All projects that impact over a third of an acre of wetland require mitigation under the state statute. Projects that are under a third of an acre, if a reasonable opportunity exists, and at the DEQ we usually find the presence of a wetland bank within the actual service area, which is a watershed and eco region as a reasonable opportunity. So we can and we do often require mitigation for projects under a thir third of an acre. Um, under our statute, if the project meets what's called the general permit, mitigation is not required unless that project is federally funded. So if you look at county road commissions, DOTs, entities like that, if they use federal funds for any portion of their project that's impacting wetlands, then they have to comply with federal no net loss and they have to actually mitigate for it. So like someone like the DOT mitigates basically for everything, 0.01 acre, 0.02 acre. They have to mitigate for all impacts because most of their projects have some phase that's actually federally funded. So the reason we got to wetland banking is because of traditional mitigation practices. There was a study in 2001 by the National Research Council that looked at mitigation nationally. And what they found is that most tr traditional mi mitigation focused on site. So if you're a new company that's going in and you're gonna impact a wetland, you're gonna build the wetland right next to your parking lot or right next to, to your building. It was primarily permit by permit. The wetlands were often placed in an area that wasn't functionally suitable for them. So it could be a 10 foot tall hill that they had to excavate 10 feet down. And there was a poor understanding of the hydrology vegetation re relationships. So as a result of that study, what they found is that wetland banking was a good option because it allowed people to create wetlands in advance of actual impact. So they could put wetlands in areas where wetlands were supposed to be, where wetlands were historically. So in 2008, the, the EPA came out with what's called the federal mitigation rule that basically put a preference on 
wetland banking. So if, if, if you look at it federally, their first thing is you need to look for a wetland bank first or in lieu of fee and something else before you do project by project mitigation. And then we followed suit in 2009 with amendments to part 303, which is our wetland statute. So basically in this state and nationally, there's a preference for wetland banking over project specific mitigation. So there's a lot of misconceptions, especially in the last five years on what a wetland bank site actually is because I get a lot of calls from people that say, I have a wetland bank site here, I have a wetland bank site there. If you don't have, so wetland banking under the state, state of Michigan definition, there's separate administrative rules specifically for wetland banking that came out in 1997. Um, what a wetland bank site is, it's the establishment of new wetlands in advance of actual losses. So you're basically building a site, creating a site, it's functioning before there's ever a permit that's assigned to, to that, that site. Um, they provide credits on, on a per acre basis, so we actually track them to the hundredth of an acre. So when we have a wetland bank site, as the site meets standards, the DEQ releases credits and then those credits can be, be sold. The bank sites service what's called a watershed and ecoregion, and I'll explain what the legal watershed and ecoregion is under statute. Um, and l like I said, it's the preferred method of, of m m mitigation. So I always have this slide in there because there, there is a lot of misconceptions on what a wetland bank site is not. I get a lot of calls saying, hey, I got 30 acres of swamp out back. Can I use it as a bank? If it's existing wetland, you cannot, under the, under the state's banking rules, enter it into an actual bank. So existing wet, wetlands are not banks. Wetlands that are, are created above what their actual need is. So if MDOT needs 10 acres of wetland and they inadvertently create 20 acres of wetland, they can't bank that extra 10 acres of wetland unless they enter into a banking agreement with the DEQ first. So one of the main things about wetland banking in the state is that if you don't have an agreement, between what's called the bank sponsor, which is the entity looking to construct the bank, and the DEQ, you don't have an official bank. Um, so that's basically what this slide is intended to mean. So under the administrative rules for, for wetland banking, there's some basic minimum requirements. The wetland has to be 10 acres in size. You have to have coordination, approval from the DEQ, and assigned banking agreement with the DEQ prior to construction. And that, that banking agreement basically details every, what, everything with that site. Details the location of the site, how many acres it is, what you're planting, what you're seeding, what the design is, the performance standards that you have to meet before we re release credit. So it goes through the whole process of getting that site established and basically says, you know, you have to meet these high standards, a certain, you know, has to be under 10% invasive species, it has to have a certain percent cover of native mean wetland species, you have to have species richness. So there's all these standards that a bank sponsor has to meet before we ever release credits in the site. And once they establish a site, they have to monitor it. And as the site meets credits, then, um, we release them in that, that site. So I would say like the average time that you would have to mo monitor a site is that probably five to 10 year time frame. Um, bank sites also require long-term management. So when somebody wants their last release of credits from a bank site, like let's say you created a 100 acre bank site, you've had 80 acres released, you wanna get that last 20 acres of credit released, we require the bank sponsor to set up an endowment, usually through a community foundation in order to fund the long-term management. So they have to find a conservancy, set up an endowment, and then that endowment basically pays the conservancy every year. So one thing that's great about bank sites is you don't just establish them, monitor them for five years, and then walk away from them. So there's a lot of benefits to wetland banking, and these are the same benefits that were found in that, that 2001 study. 
Um, from the state's perspective, it increases the state's wetland resources because these wetlands are placed on the ground, they're functioning and operating before credits are ever um, sold at, at those sites. So it's an increase in the actual state's wetland re resources. It encourages people to, to basically um, design and establish larger, better functioning units. The average bank size is probably about 50 acres in size. So you're no longer doing the 0.5 acre next to this company and 0.3 acre here, 0.5 acre there. You're building large functioning units that you can incorporate a variety of wildlife habitat and different wetland types and everything. Um, it also facilitates watershed planning. So a lot of the bank sponsors will look at things like watershed plans, determine what the needs are in the watershed, determine what the historic loss is, and then try to basically design the wetland to replace some of those loss functions. And from the applicant standpoint, I would say probably about 70% of the permits that receive now are mitigated using purchase of actual bank credits. The ones that aren't are usually impacting wetlands in an area where bank sites are not actually available. So from the applicant standpoint, if they impact a wetland and they go through the avoidance and minimization, if they want to mitigate by purchasing a bank credit, after they write the check to the bank sponsor, their obligation is done. They have no, no more obligation to be involved in that mitigation long, long term at all. So a lot of applicants would prefer to just write the check get the bank credit and then that's it. All of the responsibility is actually placed on the bank sponsor. The bank sponsor has to create it, monitor it, maintain it, control invasive species, replant trees if needed, and then find that long-term term, term manager. So from the applicant standpoint, it greatly reduces permit processing times because when they're ready to apply for the permit, they kind of have their m mitigation already in hand. They don't have to go out, find a site, find a consultant to design the site and then construct it and monitor it and maintain it and do corrective action and all those things. So this, this map is terrible, but it's actually what our legally defined watershed map is. So if you look at the administrative rules, it, it references this map. We have this map in a GIS system, but if you look at what it actually references, it's, it's this, this map. The mitigation watersheds are different. If you know anything about like eight digit hucks and 10 digit hucks, it's a different legally defined map. So the other thing that the bank site services is what's called an ecoregion, which is just a different biogeographical gra landscape. So Michigan Natural Features Inventory puts out this regional landscape ecosystem. So I'll, I'll show you what that means more, but this is the actual map. So to give you an example, so um, the example on the screen is a site that is in the Maple Ri River watershed. So the site is the little tiny red dot, which you guys can't really even see. And I can't really. Steve has gone through some of this basic info. Oh, OK. Has? OK. Yeah. OK, good. Uh, so you don't have to go in. OK. So basically in green is the watershed and in gray is the actual service area. So even though your, your bank site is just that, that dot, that's what the ser service area is. Um, did you talk about Wetlands Map Viewer? So w Wetlands Map Viewer is our online GIS system. If you guys haven't used it, it's awesome. You can click on any point on there. You can get the watershed, you can get the ecoregion, you can get the functional loss of wetlands in the area, if there's been a landscape level wetland assessment done, various aerial photos. So that's like the, the best tool to determine what watershed and ecoregion your project is actually in. So there's also this high potential wetland restoration area that's available through wetlands map viewer also. And that's what the bank sponsors use to find sites. That's what everyone uses to, to find, find sites. So this is kind of a snapshot of your guys' area. Um, basically, the arrows point to the best areas in Meridian Township to restore wetlands on paper. Doesn't mean that they're the best, like someone would have to go out there and assess them, but those areas that are shown, the areas in red used to be wetlands, are, 
our hydric soils are not currently mapped as wetland and are probably the best areas. The areas in orange were wetland from pre-settlement ve vegetation. So you're looking at areas that are either the red, orange, or the, the yellow. So I zoomed in on a couple of areas. Um, so this area here, like Venata Road, Ty Hart Road, like I don't know anything about this land. I've not been out to this site. I don't know if any of you live near this area, but on paper, this is one of the best areas to restore. Someone would have to go out there and make sure it's not curr currently wetland, but if you're looking to do wetland banking in your actual township, that's one of the best areas. If, if a lot of that is currently wetland, then it doesn't count. And I, I can't help but think as I've driven in that area, yeah. I'm not quite sure, but I think a lot of that, when you look out across, right. it's, it's wetland already. So, so that, that would be something qualify. that would need to be assessed. So, you know, you would either have to have a <clears throat> consultant or somebody that, that knows the plants and the soils actually assess that. But So this is like the first high level on paper these areas are probably the best but you guys know more about the landscape of your area so if it if it currently has wetland plants hydrology and soil doesn't qualify for for a bank if it doesn't or if it's on the edge then there's maybe something that can be be done the other area is the big muck farm area i think it used to be like bower sod farm or something like that um but if you look at it i think you're your township is only the very bottom part where it says Ingham County, correct? Yes. So if, if you're looking to mitigate within, like if, if you're looking to restore a bank site within your township, there's not a lot of opportunity. It doesn't mean you can't restore a site elsewhere that services your township and services the same watershed, which basically is what this shows. So. You know, the majority of your township is in what's called the Red Cedar Watershed. So there's quite a bit of area outside of your actual township that if somebody were to impact wetlands, they could go to that, that area. The, the last slide I showed, um, the majority of that is actually in the Looking Glass Watershed, not the actual Red, red Cedar. So you're looking at red, red cedar, so you could look at that high potential wetland restoration map, find sites. Um, if you look at the wetland banking trends, wetland banking had a slow start in Michigan, um, mostly because nobody really knew what to do with it. Like it was, a, it was a totally new program. When I was at MDOT, they gave me a bunch of money and they said create wetland banks. And I was like, well, what's wetland banks? They said like, <laughs> how can I spend this much money? So, um, so I got off to a relatively slow start, but now it's pretty much booming. So like, like I said, probably about 70% of, of the impacted wetlands go towards bank sites. Um, you know, we went from just a few bank sites to now there's, you know, clo close to 40 banks. I review banking proposals all the time. There's multiple banks in the highest need watersheds now, which is mostly like Southeast Michigan. So wetland banking is definitely where we're at as a state. That's what the applicants like. Um, that's kind of the way things are now. So if you look at the credit availability, now this is private w wetland banks. Almost the entire southern half of the lower peninsula is actually serviced by a bank site. But that being said, there's no bank site in the Red Cedar. So if there is a bank site in the Red Cedar, the way that the DEQ works is we prefer watershed mitigation over ecoregion mitigation. So if there was a bank site in the Red Cedar, we would want credits to try to go there first. So the last slide I think I have um, for you guys is DEQ does have a wetland banking um, funding program for municipalities specifically. The way that the statute was actually written, it provides $500,000 as a max towards grants that go towards um, all of the paperwork that goes into establishing a bank site. So it goes towards the design, working on the banking agreement. The banking agreement is like a 30-page document. It goes towards um, title searches and title opinions and conservation easement preparation and all that stuff. 
Um, it's first come, first serve basis. We've already spent four hundred thousand dollars that are primarily from drain commissioners working with Steve Shine. We do have a hundred thousand dollars left if a municipality is interested. First come, first serve basis. Um, and then we also provide low interest loans for construction of actual sites. So that's pretty much it. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you for that. I'm sure we have plenty of questions. I've got some, but I'll let the rest of the commissioners take first crack. So I noticed you said that there's three drain commissioners that have taken advantage of that program. What's the typical uh, sponsor look like? Is it more private companies that are focused on that? This is kind of their yeah, business Yeah, so model, the typical or? sponsor right now, like 10 years ago, the typical sponsor was MDOT. When, when I was w with MDOT, I had separate funding to est establish bank sites. So basically went out there, established a bunch of bank sites. Um, MDOT and the drain commissioners maybe total like let's say 15 sites and the rest of them are private. Most of the bank sponsors now are actually private. So they're consultants, they're some private individuals, um, primarily they're consultants that have worked with enough applicants to realize that there's a need for, for bank sites. So does the one that MDOT has to, are they used exclusively for MDOT projects? Yeah, because MDOT use it, used federal funds to create those sites, so they can't actually sell to like the private market. Okay. Otherwise, they got to reimburse the funding, and it's just it's just like yeah. a. And what about the drain commissioner ones? Did they, they use them just for their projects? So the drain commissioners are primarily using it for their projects. They do have some allowance to sell to private in situations where there's not a private bank. So the, the, the grant and loan program that we have was primarily developed to encourage establishment of wetland banks in areas that don't have a private bank market. So like Sault Ste. Marie was interested in, in economic development and no one wanted to go up there and do a bank site. So, you know, they, they entertained potentially getting some of the grant funding for it. They didn't actually do it, but that's the primary purpose of it. Okay. So what about municipalities then? So, oh, sorry, municipalities, uh, you said can also be sponsors. Right. Uh, but so, um, I guess sort of contrasting a municipality and, and a private sponsor, first of all, can a, since the sponsor is essentially responsible for the um, stewardship of the, of the bank ad infinitum, private entities often, you know, come into existence for, for a time like an opportunity like this. And right. And may disappear after a period, and I'm just wondering how does one, what, what are the sort of uh, assurances that uh, uh, stewardship is continued Right, so the main assurance is the fact that we don't release credits until they find an actual steward. So we release our first set of credits. I mean, the, the way it works is the private bank sponsors that establish these sites, there's value in them making sure that these sites meet standards. Because if the sites meet standards, then they can sell the actual credits and recoup their, their, their cost. The last 25% of the credits we don't release until they actually find a steward um, and set up that endowment, we also have financial assurances on it from the first release of credit. So from the time if, that we release the first re release of credit, we require them to get a letter of credit or a bond that we can pull on if they create it, take money, and then leave. So, and the easement is already recorded prior to them ever establishing the bank site. So the banking agreement is basically your contractual agreement. You have a banking agreement signed by the DEQ and the bank sponsor. The conservation easement is conveyed at the same time. So DEQ has an easement over that land. The bank sponsor doesn't get any funds until they construct it monitor it, maintain it, and do everything they're supposed to do for the first year. So it's a year after construction that they actually get their first release of credit. So most of the cost is already spent and the easement's already on it. 
So from our standpoint, the risk is relatively low because we have the financial assurance on it. The site's constructed. We have an easement on it. We have a contractual agreement. Before they want their last release of credit, they have to set up that endowment. If they don't do that and if they walk away, we pull on the funds and we can s set up the endowment, find a conservancy to actually manage it. And wh who would be the entities who would be the conservancies then? So it's like a land conservancy, like Southwest Land Conservancy, Southeast Michigan Land Conservancy, Heart of the Lakes Land, land Conservancy. Um, primarily it's actual land conservancies because the endowment actually pays them. So it took quite a bit of of work with the conservancies to get them interested in it, but now there's quite a few conservancies interested in, in basically getting the money from the community foundations in order to do the actual management. I see, okay, okay. Thank and it's you. a non-wasting endowment, so they only pull off the actual interest. So by the time that we, we release the last release of credit, the wetland has to be in good shape. It has to have very little invasive species. It has to be, you know, fully functioning towards our like standards as far as meeting all the standards. So the conservancy that does the long-term management, they're basically doing a couple annual inspections, spot spraying some invasive species, writing a report, and then that's pretty much it. So the cost of it is not much. So like if they set up a $100,000 endowment, that gives them about $5,000 a year to do the actual management of it. So. Can I ask one more question? Sure. So, um, so looking at this map um, of wetlands and so forth, I mean, it's almost fractal. And uh, of course, the criteria that are, are typically discussed in assessing, well, when we assess permits and things like that, are acreage. And you put it in terms of acreage as well. Right. But I'm wondering if uh, how much, uh, how important is the sort of, uh, not just area, but also length of boundary uh, to the role of wetlands. Um, as far as the buffer area? Yeah, I mean, the, the edge, the, the bank, so to speak, whatever, the transition zone between, uh, right. between one category so, and another. I mean, that if, if one is sort of localizing and concentrating uh, wetland using a, a relatively defined sort of area. globular area, yeah to compensate for a bunch of little pieces that have been uh, impacted by, say, right. a development, uh, don't we, shouldn't we also be considering that um, significant change in the balance between... Um, you mean as far as like vernal pool impacts versus using a bank site or yeah, something I mean, like we that? Yeah, I mean, we have the transition zone between the wetland and whatever the next... Yeah, next, uh, so I mean, we require is. like certain size buffers on our sites. You know, most sites that are created have some type of berm in order to control the water. Most mm -hmm. of them have adjustable water control structures, some, some type of berm. We only give them credit for what's wetland, but we make them encompass everything that, they're, that is involved in that site under easement. So the entire berm has to be under easement. Sometimes the drainage way has to be under easement. Um, I mean, I see where you're getting at, but we don't, consider that you know we may consider like if somebody impacts a wetland in an area where they're having flooding issues so let's say they they impact floodplain storage wetland um, and they want to use a bank site that's a hundred miles away that doesn't have that same functioning we may not allow that okay so the majority of cases we do allow towards bank sites because the majority of impacts we see do not have that significance but if there is a function and value of an impacted wetland that has to be replaced either on site or closer or within the sub, sub watershed we would still require that so just because there's a bank site it doesn't mean it's an automatic you know you still got to go through avoidance minimization and make sure that it's a reasonable to use that that site okay thank you yep uh, i have a question sure so I heard the, the, you mentioned invasive species a lot. So is that like a problem in the environment? Like, is it causing anything bad? So the invasive species when it comes to w w wetland banking, like our requirement is to have less than 10% invasive species. So we're basically, you know, if you look at traditional mitigation practices, you built a wetland, 
you monitored it for five years, you made sure it met standards for five years, and then you walked away from it. So 10, 10 years down the line, that wetland could have been full of invasive species, Phragmites could have came in, reed canary grass, stuff like that. So we require you to control during the actual establishment of the site less than 10% invasive species. Um, but then we, that's why we require that long-term management also, because we're trying to keep, like, once you establish it to a decent state wetland, we're trying to keep it that way. So, but it's a huge issue because, you know, in this area, you know, Phragmites is, is a little bit of an issue, but reed canary grass is our number one invasive species. So reed canary grass comes in, crowds out everything else, um, it, it reduces plant diversity, it reduces wildlife usage of the site, you know, so that's, that's the number one invasive, at least here, that a lot of people deal with. As you go towards Lake Huron, it, then it becomes Phragmites, so, but they still have to control everything. Phragmites, purple loosestrife, they don't control as much because the beetles seem to like move in and out, like they'll control it for a while and it's fine then, so. Any more here? Yeah, just, I, what's the typical endowment like per acre? How much, what does it take to set up that endowment? So I would, I would guess like, I don't know, the, the typical endowment is like, let's say 60 to $150,000. So the way the endowment's determined is the bank sponsor has to meet with a conservancy. They have to come up with a valid amount that they think that the conservancy is gonna need to management each year, and then that sets what the final and dollar amount is. What we put into the banking agreement is what we think is like a minimum dollar amount. So we might think a minimum of $60,000 will give you like $2,000 a year, but they might meet with a conservancy and they're like, we need $8,000 a year. So then they negotiate that with the bank sponsor. Yep. All right, our uh, discussions here so far have been uh, about the potential for using uh, land held in our land preservation program. And some of that may or may not coincide with the sort of high value wetland that uh, is in the kinds of maps that you produced, um, uh, which tend to coincide with our own township green space plans, mm -hmm. high priority conservation areas. So that's already kind of guiding our acquisition to some degree. Other sites that uh, uh, have been discussed may actually have uh, previously been farmed and may have been tiled. And so the question of, of disabling a, a farm tile system to recreate pre-existing wetland conditions uh, comes up. Is that something in your experience that has been done, is feasible, that's would be way, considered? That's the way 90% of all wetland restorations are done. So the bank sponsors look for sites that were historically wetland, that have been cleared, tiled, ditched, drained, that no longer have that hydro hydrology function and they look to to basically re redo what the actual like undo what what the farmer did so most sites you're breaking tiles plugging ditches um, the reason you do low head berms and water control structures is because if you're a bank sponsor you want to make 100 percent sure you can control the water so that that site functions. And the first two or three years of establishment of a site, you know, you don't know, you, they're required to do what's called water budgets to see if there's enough water and everything, but you know, it takes some of the guesswork out and then after two or three years, they know what level that wetland needs to actually be set at. So they use like agri-drain structures and everything, but yeah, that's, that's how wetlands are restored. Farmland, break tiles, low head berms, plug ditches, so. Um, and my understanding, uh, I wasn't on the Environmental Commission at the time, was that a, a bit of an, a pilot was, was done with one of the land pres sites that um, did that, but I read one of your bullets here that says that uh, one of the things a wetland bank is not is uh, a mitigation site that didn't have a prior agreement. Right. Do I understand that properly, that a retroactive uh, right. certification it's would be yeah, so it doesn't, right. So if you have a wetland that was restored by somebody else, you can't enter it into a banking agreement. This is something that 
we've discussed with MDOT because MDOT builds way more than they need. If they need 10, they'll build 20 and everything. MDOT can use it for small impacts because there's an MOU with the state that says under a third of an acre. So those wetlands don't have to be mitigated under our statute, but they do federally. So they can use them for those sorts of things. From, from your standpoint, one thing that I thought about is that if someone impacts a wetland that doesn't necessarily require mitigation from us, but you have a wetland site that you want to use, I don't, I don't think there's anything really stopping you from using that site. It's if it's required from us, they can't use a bank site unless it's an actual bank site that has a bank agreement. But from your standpoint, if someone impacts 0.15 acre and you have a what's called a pseudo bank, so say you did create one or put one under easement or something like that, you could potentially use it for your own ordinance, I guess. So I'm talking like the, the statewide bank. We would just modify our ordinance accordingly. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Could you repeat the question for the recording? Sure. So she was asking about our wetland banking registry. So if you go into like Google DEQ banking at the very bottom of the page, <clears throat> you'll see a, a banking registry. So what that is, is it's a list of all the actual bank sites, the service areas that they have. So what watershed and eco region they actually service and then what the credit availability is in, in those, those sites. So you start with the first one, you want to scroll down to the end because the first ones have been on the ground for like 10 or 15 years. So it's interesting you asked that. So what, like did you recently look at it? I was trying to find it recently and then I didn't. It was like a few months old? Yeah. So I update that every like few months. Okay, okay. Yeah, so I just, I just put a new registry update through management today so it should be on there in like Perfect, I think two days in January yeah news. yep but if you ever have any questions feel feel free to ask me so I get like the the bank sponsors are required to notify me of like credit sales and there's permits and stuff like that so I keep all the records for like what permits have been assigned to sites the bank sponsors are supposed to do it so there's like a checks and checks and balances but it changes all the time and we, and we don't update it daily or weekly or anything so if you ever want to know just like give me a call and ask me great thank you for a very informative presentation sure. we look forward to learning more about this Appreciate it. so thank you